you're about to see a video, if you guys could get that ready. And uh, this is a true story, what you're about to witness. It's about five minutes long. But let me just say that the organization we're going to be talking about today, um, and you're going to have uh, some handouts given to you. This is the Voice of the Martyrs. It was founded in October of 1967 by Pastor Richard Wumberbrand and his wife, Sabina. Richard spent 14 years in prison for his Christian witness in communist Romania. Sabina, his wife, served three years of forced labor. With $100 and an old typewriter, Richard and Sabina produced the first issue of the Voice of the of the Martyrs monthly newsletter in an effort to be a voice for the persecuted Christians around the world. Today you're going to have the opportunity to uh, join in a, a covenant of prayer for uh, people around the world and if you fill out these forms uh, to commit to pray for an entire year um, we'll be doing that right after the video as we pass those out. So if you dim the lights guys make sure the volume is up in the house and uh, let's watch this uh, brief video. <clears throat> Today we are celebrating the engagement of a young couple in our village. That is until this Christian returned. Four days ago he came into our village trying to convert us, telling everyone about his Jesus. We warned him not to come back, yet here he is. कई बार मना किया हमने कि प्रभु यीशु का प्रचार हमारे गांव में ना करें लेकिन वो मना करने के बाद भी नहीं माना और हमने उसको बहुत मार दिया ये हमें नहीं मालूम हो रहा है कि वो जीवित है या कि मर चुका है तो आप जाइए उसको देखिए उठिए ना उठिए जाइए आप आप ऐसा काम क्यों किया है
हम लोग इनके साथ क्या करेंगे अगर इसका परमेश्वर सच्चा है तो इसकी मदद अवश्य करेगा और हम इसे जाने देंगे Suta did recover and 4 days after leaving our village he came back again Now my wife and I follow Jesus and Suta is our pastor When you pray for the persecuted please remember to also pray for those who persecute For us it may be the only way we will see the love of God Amen. Brethren, if you could um, uh, go in the back, Miranda, if you could make sure they get those uh, pamphlets <clears throat> that I put out there. <clears throat> Ushers, would you help me pass these out right quick? Bring the lights up, folks. And I need, there you go, guys. I need some ushers to help me out. They're right in the back. Miranda has them. And um, these are some pamphlets I'd like for each and every one of you to take one of these, or at least one per family. Um, but uh, each one of you be fine. I think we have plenty. This is a true story about a 25-year-old man who went and spread the gospel to a hostile village in in India. Now, not all situations turned out that good. I would imagine that is a story for churches. Some of them don't have a a happy ending. Some of them end in the death of someone. I remember <clears throat> when I was in South Africa, we went into Soweto. I actually was in Alexandra where we were in one of the townships that had all the violence during apartheid and uh the pastor told my dad and I the missionary pastor said that a group of thugs came into his church and they they pulled out the head of his elder board and they beat him to death and they they killed him and the pastor and and the congregation had a funeral the next day and and uh, buried the man Uh, on the church grounds well the the mob came back and asked for that man again and um he said you killed him yesterday and they said well where is he he said we have buried him they said where is his grave to which the mob went to the grave dug the man up and beat him and burned him again even after he was deceased it's an incredible thing to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ And these are people that do not have the freedoms that we have in this pamphlet. You'll hear and you'll see maps and stories of what you can do to sign up to pray, to adopt a frontline worker and pray for them daily for the next year. We should use our freedom doing positive and productive things. And I want to encourage you as a free Christian to not just bow your chest out and be proud of our liberty, but let's use it. for the kingdom of God. Kate, could you come up here right quick? This is unannounced. Come up here, Kate. I want you to to tell the people something. We talked about this today in confirmation. And I'm going to ask Kate to tell you what the definition of a Christian is in our world today. Okay? A Christian is a person that is like Christ. And what what are we is according to our our pamphlet, our book, our catechism book. The Christian is the visible what? What is it? The visible form of heaven on earth. It's the say that one more time. Listen very carefully. The visible form of the kingdom of heaven on earth. Thank you, Kate. God bless you. If we indeed are the visible form of the kingdom of heaven on earth, we should do kingdom things. And that means the least we can do is to support our brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no difference between them and you and I in Christ. they share that heritage they share that kindred they share that family of Jesus Christ with us doesn't matter what they look like or what language or accents they have they are our brothers and they are our sisters in Jesus Christ guys there's one more thing i'd like for you to pass out uh, uh Dylan there's a there are four boxes back there ushers i'm sorry if you get up one more time we want to give you a a gift something that uh, we'd like for you to Uh, brandish and wear with pride these are bracelets uh very much like Lance Armstrong made popular except these are are black 
and they they represent like we, we have on our lapels many of us the uh, uh, Nazareans and um, it has the Nazarene symbol on it and this is just a way for you to stand in solidarity with your Christian brothers and sisters across the world Now we should have enough we have uh, uh, about a hundred of them so I want to make sure each and every one of you receives one of these bracelets so guys while you're <clears throat> passing that out let me remind you please to pray and if you can if you want to take it a step further uh, there is opportunity here for you to also pledge your support uh, they will be contacted you but these cards are about prayer and I, I hope that each and every one of you will be a part of this to commit to pray for a frontline worker like Suta this could be us yes ma'am yes right Wow. In the pamphlet, it also tells us to pray for their persecutors. That's a little bit harder to do. That's the thing that the visible, the visible uh, kingdom of heaven on earth does. There's some difficult things to do to forgive those who persecute you, to forgive those who do ugly things, and to forgive those that are enemies of the gospel, the good message of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, Scripture says, Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. The Bible commands us to love one another. And a lot of times we think it just means to love our brother and sister in church. And, and guys, that is so elementary. That is so basic. Obviously, we should. The church is supposed to be a light to the world. We are supposed to go around preaching the gospel. We are supposed to be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And we spend so much try time trying to get along with each other. It's just ridiculous. This is the proverbial dog chasing his tail around in circles. We're supposed to be light. We're supposed to be ambassadors. We're supposed to love and be friend those people that need Christian leadership and influence. Yet the Christian church spends so much time just trying to get along with each other. It is a trap that the devil has set for us that we have swallowed hook, line, and sinker. As a pastor, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, by which I was called at the tender age of 12 years to preach the gospel and to minister to the Lord. The Lord didn't call me to come and preach in a local congregation only. He didn't call me to come and be the pastor of individual congregations or youth groups. He called me to be a minister of the gospel, period. And there's a lot of ways for you to minister the gospel. So one of the reasons that I do enjoy doing, getting into the secular market because I can go places that preachers don't go. They're not there. A lot of times we're just completely consumed by the schedule of a congregation in a church and we cannot go beyond those boundaries. But by you allowing me to be in the secular market, I'm able to fully and completely fulfill my calling to God. And that's to be light any and everywhere, even in the secular market. I did not come here to New Tabor or go to Palestine or Colleen or Chrisfield, Maryland or Houston, Texas or Kingsville, Texas and Freeport, Texas. I didn't go to any of these assignments to perpetuate a local congregation. I didn't come to any of these assignments to be bound by constitution and bylaws of any denomination or movement. I was called into the ministry of the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Messiah. 
I was called to preach. I was called to minister. I was called to love. I was called to forgive. I was called to disciple, to assist congregations, to minister to their communities and to the world. I was called to thrive in the brotherhood of Christianity. I was called to live in a large, large world. I was called to be able to be counted on by my Lord, my Savior, and my God. People that just live within a congregation live in a very, very small world. They have a very, very small mind. And they have very, very small vision, if any at all. You are called for greater things. This is a part of what we do. This is a training ground. This is a, an encouraging arena. And sometimes the local church is not the place to go for encouragement. Sometimes the opposite takes place in a local congregation because the devil, unfortunately, is successful in a lot of the things that he does within us. I want you today to look beyond our county, beyond our property lines, and I want you to see the brotherhood, the Christian brotherhood, those friends and family members that we have across this world that look different, speak different, maybe a different shade, may have a different accent, but they are Christians nonetheless. And they share with you and me the kindred spirit of being heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ. That's right, you're called. The word holy means called. It means that we are set apart, that God has said, this is special. David Johnson is special. Paul Thornton, but you are special. We are special. We are called. Kyle Albright, you are special. Called of God. That's who we are as Christians. And the Lord takes us and he, he puts us on his mantle and he says, Oh, I love this person. I've died for this person. And I'm going to tell you something, friends. These persons, these people, we must be worthy. By the, by the blood of Jesus we are, but we must be willing and able to go out, represent, to talk about Christ, to love people, to befriend them. And you can befriend, you can love people, and you can disagree with them. There's this thing in the world today. It is a worldly, shallow kind of love. That says that if you love someone, you'll agree with everything they do. I got friends that I don't like at all, but I love them. That I will not retract my friendship from them. And I have been tempted. I got one close friend that has disappointed me and devastated the kingdom of God. And it just grieves my heart. And I have been so tempted to say, I'm done with him. But the reason I won't is because Jesus Christ has never looked at me when I disappointed him and said, I'm done with David. So I stand with my friend. I love my friend, but I disagree with my friend hand over fist. And it's because I can stand with him, I can love with him, I can converse with him, and I can disagree with him that I can help him. We need to stand with those of like faith. We are not alone. We are not alone in this world. There are millions and millions and millions of Christians that share Christ with us in Georgia, in Ohio, in Montana, in New Mexico, in Massachusetts. Yeah, even Massachusetts. 
Our relationship with Jesus through the cross makes us kindred spirit brothers. And I need to look beyond my little world and live in a larger world and say that it's not just about me. It's not just about my congregation. It's about the brotherhood. This is why, as pastor of this church, that whenever the minister's alliance is doing something, I want to be all over it. I want to be there because this is the visible form of the kingdom of heaven in Burleson County. And even though I don't agree with every pastor in town, I love every pastor in town because I have a brotherhood with them through Christ. We have small differences, but we don't allow those differences to separate us. That is the key to loving people is that not allowing someone else's difference, even sin, to separate you from them. Because if you're not in their world, you can't influence their world. We need to love without endorsing and condoning. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. I don't believe that men are better than women. I don't believe that women are better than men. I don't believe that I'm better than Jew or a Jew is better than me. I don't believe that, that I, I believe we are one in Christ. We are God's creation. There's no big U's and little I's or what have you. We are all with Christ together. God has used them, but they often get in the way of the brotherhood. You know who I'm talking about? Denominations. Denominations are overrated. I remember asking my dad one time about denominations. I said, Dad, did God create denominations? You know what dad said? He said, no, David, he didn't, but he uses them. I love that. So we create something, and God goes, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a place. I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this better. I'm, gonna, I'm going to do something with this. Denominations, a lot of things happen in denominations. A lot of good, a lot of bad. But God uses them. Our language and our accents, our doctrines, our beliefs, as I said before, our skin, all these things may be different. I may be awkward with the culture of someone from another denomination or someone from another race or someone from another culture. But I am in love with their Jesus and he draws us together. He is the one who brings us together. We are all Nazarenes. We are believers. We are Christians. I heard something the other day with the political landscape. Some of you remember this. This is actually about two weeks old. About as, I wrote this sermon two weeks ago, actually. But I heard on the news where that a Presbyterian was attacking a Seventh-day Adventist in the political landscape. And the Presbyterian talked about the religion of another candidate. Friend, if you're Seventh-day Adventist and you're Presbyterian, you're the same religion. All we were doing in that was, was just just magnifying our ignorance as Christians, but not even knowing the difference between a denomination and a religion. I told you this before, but please don't ever illuminate. Please don't ever advertise your ignorance by saying that, that a Methodist and an Assembly of God are two different religions. They're denominations within the Christian religion. Ugh. But yet we go public with it and tell the world... And hope the world is as stupid as we are. I'm tired of that type of ignorance. I may not be a Puritan. How many remember the Puritans? Remember seeing them? I, I, I remember them in grade school, in elementary school. In high school, didn't see any more Puritans. <laughs> I don't know why, but the Puritans were very, very radical. They were very, very legalistic. And I'm not as legalistic as a Puritan would have been. But I share Christ with our founding fathers. We need to learn that this kingdom is bigger than the borders and the boundaries that you put up around it. Those walls will crumble in the face of Christ. My job as a pastor is to prepare you for the judgment seat 
of Christ. And I've told you before, when you stand before Christ, please don't stand ignorant. And if you choose to be ignorant, please don't advertise to the Lord that I was your pastor. I don't do this for position. I don't do this for money. Ask any elder, ask any president that I've served with over the, the last 11 years. I never negotiated one dime with this church. I never have asked for a raise. I've actually turned some down. That's not what this is all about. This is about the kingdom of heaven. This is about us walking with God. This is about us sharing the gospel in our time. Making a difference in our community. Helping our children, our grandchildren to grow up responsible and mature. That need not be ashamed of the ignorance that we see on television. As Christians fight and scuffle over an office that's not that impressive. We must learn that our church family is not just our congregation. But rather that we stand with our families across the town, and the world. We are God's kingdom. We are that visible kingdom of God on earth. We are that image of God's kingdom on this earth. When people think faith, they think us. The other day, <clears throat> I was trying to decide which driver to choose to drive us to Dallas. Because I want to use that opportunity to minister to someone. I could drive it myself, but I frankly don't want to. I would much rather be with you the whole time and not have to run back to Austin late Saturday night. So I'm talking to the Lord and said, Lord, who can I get? Because I've got a lot of projects in that lot. <laughs> and two of the people that I'm closest to that I'm working on, one's an atheist and the other one is a lesbian who's married to another lesbian. And I remember saying, Lord, I'm, 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 I'm stuck here. I want them to meet my church family. I want them to feel the love of Jesus. And listen, when we go to Dallas, let's bless the socks off the whoever that is. I want you to shake their hand. I want you to, if they'll let you love, love their neck, I want you to, to do it. Let's, let's be Jesus to them. And let's show them what they don't see usually. <clears throat> and I said, Lord, what am I going to, who are we going to get? What do you think? And like the Lord usually does, he usually lets me make that decision. And just the other day, both of them, I told Ron, I said, this baffles me. Both of them talked with me yesterday. On that lot, there's probably 40 or 50 drivers. And the odds of those two people having a, an alone audience with me on that day it, it was almost like an audition. I thought, Lord, what are you doing? Why don't you just pick one? But he showed me both of them. It's an assignment. It's an opportunity that we would never, ever reach these people. And you know what? Maybe it's the only Jesus they'll see for the next 10 years, if at all. The Lord wants you to be engaged with the world, not just the congregation. There's people that need you that I can't reach. I don't have an inroad to them. You do. And God calls your name out and says, I want you to reach this world right here. His name is Tony. Her name is Deb. I want you to reach them for me. Or be a part of reaching them because God doesn't always want you to close the deal. He's got somebody else he's working on that may not be ready to close that deal. We've got to live in a big world. And there are people out there that are giving it all, being beat to death. We read a story of one in China that was drowned in his own drowned in urine. There's some terrible things. Fox's Book of Martyrs, if you've never read it, get it. You can get it on Amazon, read it. These are our, 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 our church fathers and the, the, the apostles, how they died. And when you read and realize what has gone on in this world, you won't just sit on your freedom. You will use your freedom to be a part of God's family. What if God's counting on you? 
What if he's saying, man, if Ken would just come around, I need Ken to do something. I just need, you know, Ken, I know you'd say, God, use me now. I want to be ready. Let's be ready. Let's take our limited glasses off and see the world and say, Lord, use me. Here am I. As Elijah said, send me. I want to be a part in my time of what you're doing. Please show me that honor. Prepare me. Teach me. Humble yourself in the eyes of God. And he will lift you up and use you for his glory. It is a great honor. And when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, instead of him saying, why didn't you? Why didn't you? What happened there? Were you worried about your image? Have you forgotten of mine? Instead, you'll be able to say, Lord, I gave it a go. I was in the game. I made an argument. I took a stand. And once you do that one time, you say, Lord, what's next? Please trust me with another opportunity. I love it that he doesn't expect us to close the deal. In Christianity, it's not ABC. It's not always be closing as it is in the business world. In Christianity is just put another block on the wall. Just keep working. Just keep ministering. Just keep representing me. God has a complex network to reach one single soul. It's amazing. I'm going to have thousands of people, I'm sure, to thank for my salvation when I get to heaven. Dad closed the deal. He had to put his black walnut ice cream down to do it. <laughs> he wasn't prepared for that, but I had been set up by other Christians all around me, people praying for me, and I'm going to have a lot of people to thank. I want to encourage you to be one of those people that are thanked when you go to heaven. Stand with me, please. Let's conclude before we sing by praying for the persecuted church. And ushers, if you'd be prepared, let's, let's send them an offering. The bracelets that you have as these lapels, all of these, half of the money goes to the persecuted church. But I want to go over and beyond that. I want to send an offering to them. So I want to encourage you to do your best. I believe you can make the checks out to Voice of the Martyrs or just, tell you, just make them out to uh, New Tabor Brethren Church. And our, our treasurer and financial secretary will write a check from New Tabor to that organization. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we get it. We understand. Help us, Lord. Help us not to trash our freedom and to waste it like a sluggard and a sloth, Father, not do anything with our freedom. Help us, Lord, to use our freedom to support, to pray for, to minister to our family. And Lord, there are family members that aren't doing right, and they need our help. They need our love. They need our disagreement. They need our debating. Help us, Father, to be used by you and not to swallow the lies of the devil, but to be rather visible form of the kingdom of heaven on this earth, your ambassadors. Lord, it is an honor. Help me to be worthy of that. By your grace and your Holy Spirit, I will. And so with this congregation, in Jesus' name, God's children say, please, amen. Remain standing, Brother Paul.